Uh, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. Now, for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind of individuals. And my guest this evening is a repeat, Dan Meek, is a personal friend of mine. He's also a progressive populist very active in social justice issues and he's been on the show a number of times in the past because and I've had him on again because he's so interesting and so good looking and uh, it's he, not going to do my John Edwards <laughs> move <laughs> and, and he knows so much about what's going on in Salem and not just in Salem Salem but uh, also issues that affect other states in the country and other and other parts of the country too but uh, instead of doing a long drawn out uh, bio uh, because the viewers have seen you before and they know who you are, but let's do a brief overview of who you are and what you're about. Will you? Shall I ask you the first question? Sure. So, we have my cheat sheet here that says we may talk about the federal debt ceiling debate, the Oregon legislature's extra special session, the new U.S. Supreme Court case, McCutcheon versus Citizens United on steroids. Mm -hmm. Other new U.S. Supreme Court cases, so we've got quite an agenda ahead of us here, and it's going to go really fine. So, uh, Dan, if I were to ask your best friend, who is Dan Meek? What would your best friend say? You're the first person. Dan is what? Um, I guess um, an activist public interest attorney. Be the, say it in the first person as though you're your friend. As though I'm my own friend? No, you, <laughs> you, you are your friend speaking. Yes. Dan is what? Uh, Dan is an, uh, an activist, uh, public interest attorney. Mm -hmm. And that's all he is? Pretty much. Anything more about him? Mm, not much. Is, is Dan nice or mean or friendly or...? Um, uh, nice to his friends, um, possibly somewhat intense to um, people who are ripping off others. There isn't a mean bone in your body. I've known you for a while. <laughs> you're so easy to be with. Right. There's an easy smile, and you're tenacious in Salem. And anyhow, let's go on with uh, the personal stuff. Uh, and when and where were you born? Pocatello, Idaho. Idaho? Yes. Mm. October 16th. Uh, what year? 1953. 53. Okay, why'd you leave? Well, um... Uh, I left to go to college um, and um, uh, and to uh, come to a you know a bigger a bigger place a more uh, a place that is more I guess compatible with me of course Pocatello Idaho is very heavily uh, LDS Mormon I'm not Mormon so didn't fit in too well there you didn't fit in why is that you didn't fit in with the Mormons you a, a radical or well, heretic or something no just um, not Mormon, and um, the the society there is very is very much um, centered on the church, and yes. many activities are centered on the church. And if you're not a member of the church, it's you know you're a bit of an outsider. Hmm. So why did you decide to become an outsider and not be a Mormon? Um, that's I don't know. Okay. I, I became temporarily a Presbyterian uh -huh. uh, because the our next door neighbor in, in Pocatello there were about 30 or so Mormon churches and, and uh, one of, of some Protestant denominations and a couple of Catholic churches. It was a town of about 30,000 people when I was growing up. Uh -huh. And um, my father often worked on Sundays, took, the, took our car to work on Sunday. He was a train dispatcher and so if um, if I wanted to go to Sunday school or church, I had to catch a ride with somebody, and our next-door neighbors were Presbyterian. Okay. That's, <laughs> Accident. That's it. Yes, that's right. So I became a Presbyterian for several years. Um, Do you have a religious preference today? None. None. Mm. No religion. Hey, religious. Okay. And uh, as you know, if I ask a question that you don't want to answer, why well, don't answer it and just say you made a mistake, don't ask me that question or something? I'll, I will lash out viciously if that happens. <laughs> That'll be the day. <laughs> and you're an attorney, so you had a good uh, education in college and like that? I particularly had a good education at the University of Wyoming, followed up by a um, by Stanford Law School, but I, I uh, enjoyed Wyoming more. <laughs> Stanford Law School. Yeah, it's pretty hard to get into that, isn't it? 
Yeah, and, and going to Wyoming was actually a big benefit because um, I think Stanford had a, a, a HIC quota that every once in a while, every, every few years, they had to take somebody from Wyoming. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that was me. Yeah. So we know about your work in Salem and the kind of anything else that you, that you do in your life, everyday life, that would be of interest to the viewers. Um, I uh, ride bicycles, um, recumbent bikes. I um, I used to be into kayaking, but after after cutting my head open a few times, that, that was that was discouraging. So. A few times. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't learn the first time, huh? Uh, you have a partner, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, or one of yes. those. Yes. All of the, the above. All uh, the above. A uh, a long time companion. Mm hmm. Good. Okay. And dumb question: political persuasion. Are you a Tea Partier? Uh, pretty close. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I my I guess I would identify most with the Progressive Party of Oregon. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, memberships in political, social, or civic organizations. You're a member of the uh, Oregon Progressive Party. I'm actually. Um, a member of the Oregon Independent Party. Oregon Independent Party. Mm -hmm. And you're active with the Oregon Progressive Party too? As well, yes. As well. Uh, mm, double hitter. Huh? Okay, yeah. Uh, any persons from the past that are or are alive today that you partic particularly like or look up to? Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader? Why Ralph Nader? Um, he's uh, sort of the ultimate role model of someone who um, has taken on the establishment by himself, mm -hmm. um, prime, well, starting out by himself in the early 1960s um, on auto safety and, and other issues. And then he, uh, he used his, um, his settlement with General Motors to uh, create um, a large number of public interest groups that are still, many of which are still operating today and, and doing valuable work. So um, Ralph is certainly a, um, a, the ultimate role model. He's a hero of mine, too, but I think we've just lost uh, the few P tea partiers who are watching this show when you said that. <laughs> Ralph Nader, hero. Yay, Ralph Nader. Well, uh, if, the, if the Tea Party folks are, are really anti-establishment, they ought to consider Nader, who is, is, is sort of the ultimate anti-establishment figure, not only government establishment, but corporate establishment as well. For a long time, huh? Well, for 50 years. Since the, the over Corvair, years, huh? Over 50 years, yes. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And he's still going strong. He still, he still um, exhausts all of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. He still has, you know, he, he's just uh, uh, has amazing endurance. Amazing endurance. Occasionally, I'll see him on some talk shows, usually on free speech TV or someplace mm -hmm. like that. But rarely we, we get him on uh, corporate uh, uh, stations or networks. Right. Uh, what's most important nowadays to pay attention to? I think you, that's in your list of things we may talk about. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. I can't think of anything else to ask you. Shall we start right into mm -hmm. the subject of the show? Uh, the title of the show is What's in Topical Issues as of October 16, 2013. We talked about a number of things on the phone and I couldn't narrow it down to any one particular, so that will cover a broad uh, swath of things we can talk about. And I got some notes here, and uh, I think I'll refer to them to start off our conversation. You ready? Sure. If the U.S. government's debt ceiling is not raised by tonight, will financial chaos ensue? Well, uh, we had a decision in Washington today. Not yet. I thought they agreed. No, there's, the House has not voted. In fact, the Senate hasn't voted either. So, yeah. <clears throat> so you think they're going to go through and have the vote? Um, I don't know. They probably will, but um, even even what they're considering tonight, October 16th, is simply to push the debt ceiling off until January or February, and to reopen the government only until January or February. And why does that make you unhappy? Well, I don't know that it makes me unhappy. I'm, it makes me unhappy. Um, it does seem like a this whole the whole debt ceiling does seem like to be does seem like a strange concept. I mean, it's sort of like saying that um, let's say I go out, 
go out and borrow a uh, hundred dollars from um, from various people. Mm -hmm. I then, once I owe people a hundred dollars, I then unilaterally declare that I'm only going to pay eighty. I have a debt ceiling of eighty. I mean, this is not a the debt ceiling is not something that's imposed by creditors. It's not like your your credit card limit because your credit card limit is set by the bank or the creditors. They say, we will loan you $100 and no more. The debt ceiling is a ceiling that is established by the debtor, the United States government. Uh -huh. And it says, we, the United States government, are going to um, spend a whole bunch of money and borrow a, whole bu borrow a whole bunch of money. And then we set our own debt ceiling so that if we, if we borrow a large enough amount of money, we declare that we're not going to pay it back. Have we ever done that? Well, that's what the debt ceiling does. It declares we're not going to pay more than, it's around you know, $15 billion of debt now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a strange concept. It's not like a credit card limit. It's the opposite. It's the, it's the credit card holder limiting himself from paying back the debt that he's incurred. And um, I would like to show a couple of slides here that sort of illustrates what's going on. Of and course, why. And other, sure. Some other reasons I think that the debt ceiling um, controversy um, is, just misses the point. The first one, the first chart uh, indicates the U.S. Uh, debt level, in, uh, how it's risen since 1940. I hope these charts can be, there we go. There we go. These charts can be integrated. And it's up to about 16.4 trillion. This this chart is a few months old, so I think it's 16 point, about 16.8 trillion now. Mm -hmm. So that seems like a large increase. Uh, it seems like an exponential rate of increase, but it's actually not as dramatic as you might think. The second chart here shows the uh, U.S. Treasury debt as a percentage of gross domestic product by president and uh, and party. It starts out with uh, President uh, Roosevelt in the 1940s, and that first peak is World War II, mm -hmm. where the uh, federal debt became equal to 120% of annual gross domestic product. Then the debt after the war, the debt came down. It came down as a percentage of gross domestic product under Truman in blue, under Eisenhower in red, under Kennedy in blue, under Nixon in red, and a little bit under Ford in blue. Um, pardon me, Nixon and Ford are both in red, and it continued down a little bit in Carter in blue. It first started to increase in sort of real dollar terms under Reagan in 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, went up pretty substantially there. You said, see those the red lines um, going up. Under Clinton, those blue lines, it went back down again. Under Bush, it went back up again. And then the, the final four or five blue lines are the Obama administration, but the first couple of lines certainly are attributable to the, to the 2008 financial collapse and the, the necessity for a massive government spending and, and stimulus in order, to, in order to get the economy running. So one interesting feature, is, as you'll notice, is that the, under every Democratic president since Truman, the, the the Treasury debt has gone down. Uh, under both Republican presidents since Reagan, the, the Treasury debt has gone up. Um, with the single exception, of course, of being Obama, the debt has gone up, but uh, probably because of the of circumstances that, that he inherited. But in any event, we're now back approaching the levels of debt that uh, the United States had, uh, had during World War II. Um, the the strange thing about the Treasury debt is that uh, a lot of it isn't actually debt. For example, let's say that I borrow $100 from you, and you hand me the $100, and I put it in my pocket. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's debt. I have borrowed money from you. Yeah. But let's say I take $100 out of my left pocket, and I put it in my right pocket. Uh -huh. Have I borrowed that money? You, you borrowed it from one pocket. I, Borrowed it from myself. Is that is that a debt that I owe? Tell me the rest of the story. I, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> is that what's happening in our federal government? Yeah. The, the next chart indicates this was back when we only had about fifteen billion dollars of debt, and it shows who owns the debt, who owns the treasury bonds and, and treasury bills. And in the lower right-hand quadrant, uh, in red, 
you see at 2.5 billion, that's the Social Security Administration. It's part of the federal government itself. So the federal government borrowed from the Social Security Administration. Which is part of the federal government. How can it do that? Out of one pocket to the other one? One pocket to the other one. Now, in that case, it kind of makes sense because the Social Security Administration is where the money goes from the, the FICA taxes that, uh, that are withheld and, and that every, uh, pretty much everybody pays. F FICA means what? Federal Insurance something or other. I don't know what the yes, A stands for. Yeah. But it's Social Security and Medicare. Mm -hmm. And so that money goes to the Social Security Administration and the, the Social Security Administration collects far more money every year than it pays out. And it's building up a, a, you know, a big, the big Social Security Trust Fund. And so that money, that excess money has to go somewhere. So the Social Security Administration buys Treasury bonds. And that's two and a half billion dollars of the debt. That kind of makes sense because the Social Security Administration itself has its own responsibilities uh, to pay recipients of Social Security and Medicare. So it kind of makes sense to treat that as two different people. The Federal Treasury on the one hand and the Social Security Administration on the other hand. But if we go back to this, that same chart, you'll see on the bottom there is a green bar there, a green interval that says 1.7 billion. That's the, that is the U.S. United States Federal Reserve banking, banking system, the U.S. Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. It's now up to two billion, by the way, uh, and that, that number is up to two billion. And that money, it's hard to say that that's owed to anybody. Um, over the past couple of years, the, uh, the um, Federal Reserve and this, this chart shows what's been going on with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve in 2008 owned about $476 billion worth of Treasury bonds. Now it owns, it's on this chart, $1.9 billion, but it's up over $2, billion, $2 trillion dollars. Isn't the Federal Reserve a, a private uh, organization? No, it's, it's part of the federal government. Okay. Um, it is a federal agency. And what the Federal Reserve does is... In, in buying this additional $1.5 trillion of federal debt over the past five years or so um, and becoming the second largest holder of federal debt in the world, the first largest holder of federal debt being the Social Security Administration. Okay. Um, where did this money come from for the Federal Reserve to buy the Treasury bonds? We know where Social Security's money came from. Okay. It came from the taxes that we pay. Where did the Federal Reserve's money come from to buy these Treasury bonds? And in many cases, the Federal Reserve now is buying $80 billion of Treasury bonds every month. Where does that money come from? I give up. They make it up. Printed? They used to call it printing when money was printed. Uh huh. Since money basically isn't printed anymore uh, for most transactions, the, federal, the clerk at the Federal Reserve just goes, oh, I, I am going to spend $85 billion this month in buying Treasury bonds. So I will simply, at my computer terminal, click, you know, type in the numbers, type in the number, $85 billion. Voila, I own, I now own, I now have $85 billion that I just created, and I'm now I'm going to buy Treasury bonds with it. Who in the Federal Reserve makes those kinds of decisions? Federal Reserve Board itself. And who makes up the Federal Reserve Board? The Federal Reserve Board is a board, I believe, of, <coughs> I don't know exactly, 10 or 14 individuals. Sure. Um, they are appointed, the, the board members are appointed to 14-year non-renewable terms. The chairman of the board is, of course, Ben Bernanke at this point, and the chairman is appointed to a four-year term and can be appointed to successive terms. Mm -hmm. um, Bernanke was an appointee of uh, President Bush, reappointed by President um, Obama, kind of like Alan Greenspan was the appointee of President Reagan, reappointed by President Clinton. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that both Democratic and Republican presidents like to appoint Republican Republicans mm -hmm. to, to the chair, the the, um, the board, the board, and I believe Janet mm -hmm. Yellen, the new who will become the new chairman next year, if she's confirmed, will be the first person who's not a Republican chairman of the board in something like 35 years, a long time. Why is there a Federal Reserve? 
Well, the Federal Reserve um, controls the money supply, and it can create money, and it can destroy money, and that's what it's doing now uh, over the past several years has been creating money. So $2 billion of the 16 or trillion, pardon me, $2 trillion of the 16 or so trillion dollars in U.S. debt is actually owned by the Federal Reserve using money it simply created. So once, so we have a, if we have a debt limit that we're now bumping up against, uh -huh. and over two billion, two trillion dollars of that debt is owed to the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve could simply um, forgive the debt. It has no economic consequence because it's simply taking money out of your left pocket and putting it in your right pocket. Why would it do that? Why would, well, if the federal, what I'm saying is that um, the, the, all of the hoopla about, oh, we're going to come up to a debt limit and we can't spend money, well, you can spend, you can effectively increase the debt limit by $2, billion, $2 trillion by having the Federal Reserve forgive the $2 trillion that the Treasury owes to the Federal Reserve, just cancel that debt. Uh, so you don't, you don't care about uh, a limit on the, the debt? I think limit, a, a limit on the debt imposed by the debtor himself, in the, ca you know, in the case of, of the debt ceiling, doesn't make any sense. To them it makes sense. To whom it makes sense? The government. Well, why does it make sense to impair your own, essentially impair your own credit? You're saying that I'm going to go out and spend as much money as I want, and I'm going to incur as much debt as I want, but then I'm going to put a limit on the debt that I pay back. It's not really a limit on debt. It's a, let, it's a limit on paying back. There's been no limit on paying back so far, is there? has there? Yeah, that's what, that's what the debt limit is. It says you can't have more debt outstanding than a certain amount. And if you're only bringing in, the United States government is currently bringing in about $200 billion a month. And if you have to pay out more than $200 billion uh, in a given month, um, and, you've, and you're up to the debt ceiling, according to the, according to the law of the debt ceiling, you're not supposed to pay, you're not supposed to make the payment. So it is a self-imposed limitation on repayment. Yeah. Now, if the United States wanted that, to me, that really seems to be designed to impair the credit of the United States, because it's the debtor who's saying, "I'm not going to, pay, I'm not going, I'm only going to pay back up to a certain amount." But we haven't done that, have we? Yes, we have. That's called the debt ceiling. The, the We're debt only ceiling going to pay there, back these up to a certain people amount. That, these groups that we owe money to, we haven't uh, reneged on paying them back, have That's we? That's because we always increase the debt ceiling. So, okay, so you think increasing the debt ceiling is not a good idea? I think having a debt ceiling doesn't make any sense to begin with. So what would you do instead of having a debt ceiling? Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that the debt ceiling, as I uh, tried to indicate, is currently not really meaningful because a large amount of the debt the federal government owes to itself and can cancel. It can cancel the, the debt owed to the Federal Reserve. But it hasn't. It hasn't? No, but it could. Okay. Thanks for the patience with me. I'm getting a lesson that I, I didn't have before. Anyway, most people think that the, the debt is mainly owed to foreign countries. Um, but that, is, that just isn't the case, as the, as the little graph indicates. That um, the, little, uh, the graph has a little chunks there for Japan. The largest uh, holder, foreign holder of federal debt is Japan. The next largest is China. The next largest is the United Kingdom, that is Great Britain. Um, oil exporters, um, that is, you know, basically your, your OPEC states and Brazil. But, um, but they are not as large a holder of federal debt as the federal government itself. So do you think if things got bad enough in our country, in our economic system, then the U.S. would default and then have to uh, tell China and Japan and the rest of the people, we don't have the money to pay you, so we're going to pay you only uh, 60 or 80 percent of what we owe you, and as some other countries have done. Uh, would that ever happen? I don't know. I don't think so. 
Um, and I think that the United States has, has less debt than is, is typically reported because I, don't cons I wouldn't think that the $2 trillion that is owed to the Federal Reserve is actually debt. So this is like a shell game in our government. Yeah, I think so. One pocket to the other pocket. One pocket to the other pocket. How does that affect the ordinary citizen? Um, eventually, you would think that creating, simply creating an extra $2 trillion would uh, tend to inflate the money supply and eventually result in inflation. And inflation for the average, you know, you hear it these days that inflation is low, you know, 1.5%, something like that. But inflation for the average person is actually quite a bit higher than 1.5%. The, uh, the uh, inflation in um, food and utilities is, is higher than that. And you would expect that simply creating $2 trillion um, out of nothing uh, would, would tend to increase inflation. Hasn't happened to a large degree yet, but that's eventually what would be expected. So the, the average citizen's money would be worth less as far as, right. as, far as buying power is concerned. And the other thing it does, well, it's affecting <coughs> a, lot of, a, a lot of folks now, particularly seniors, because this money that is being created is being used to buy treasury bonds to keep the interest rates on treasury bonds down. And interest rates on almost everything else is tied to treasury bonds. So it used to be, if, you know, five years ago, that you could easily get five or six percent on a savings account, uh, on a one or two year uh, certificate of deposit, you could get six or seven percent on mm -hmm. a, As you go out further, you get uh, higher interest rates on certificates of deposit. So seniors who have all, who want to have their funds invested in a safe manner with, for example, certificates of deposit at a bank that are, that's insured by the Federal Deposit in, by FDIC mm -hmm. so that they, they can't lose the money. Um, those folks were earning 5 or 6 percent four or five years ago and even three years ago. But now they're not. Now they're earning essentially nothing mm. because uh, CDs, certificates of deposit, uh, you know, one or two year or three or even five year certificates of deposit now are, are generally under 1%. Um, so it, it is hurting the average person who has any, any amount of savings, particularly people who depend on their savings um, in order to, uh, you know, for their day-to-day -day expenses. How about the super rich? Uh, the, those kinds of shenanigans you're talking about now, is that affecting them negatively? Um, not so much, because the super rich generally don't put their money in extremely, you know, extremely safe, uh, insured investments like like certificates of the bank, certificates of deposit, they're more likely to have their money in the stock market. And um, the stock market has also reacted very dramatically to this creation of, you know, an additional $1.5 trillion uh, by the Federal Reserve. In fact, the, most observers think that the stock market fluctuates based upon, now based upon primarily, what observers think the Federal Reserve is going to do, whether they're going to continue to create 80 to 85 billion dollars a month um, to buy more treasury bonds. So in your note to me it says the federal debt ceiling debate is phony. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I have no more questions for you. Yes, you have some more comment or information for me? Nope. On the federal debt ceiling debate? No, that's about it. All right. Shall we move on? Sure. Uh, we had a uh, the Oregon legislature's extra special session, and they talked about the tax bill and the seeds bill. Will you talk about that? Sure. The Oregon legis the Governor Kitzhaber called the Oregon legislature uh, in for a um, for what was billed as a one-day special session on September 30th. That took that did take three days, and um, did some interesting things, mainly uh, involving taxes, and then they tacked on the tacked onto it. Um, a bill that precludes local governments from in any way regulating uh, or controlling seeds or products of seeds. Let me cut you off here because I got a notice we should take a break here before okay. they get into this discussion. Okay. Can, we take, can we take a break there, please?
Okay, we're back. Thank you for staying tuned. And for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals. And uh, like most of you out there, my guest tonight again is Dan Meek. And uh, glad to have you back again. And the second half of the show will be uh, a little less difficult for me to handle here because he lives this stuff day after day and I'm just an ordinary citizen. Not that stuff. <laughs> and I'm aware I'm talking a little funny now because I was at the dentist again today. I just had some serious dental work done weeks ago and went in and had a little upgrade in the work that was done. And I'm still a little nervous about biting the inside of my jaw again. So. So I'm talking a little funny now, so bear with me. I'm not losing it, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> not tonight, anyhow. So let's go back to where we, we were talking about the Oregon legislature's extra special session and the tax bill and the seeds yep. bill. You were talking about the seeds bill in, in, in Salem. Well, if you want to start with the seeds bill, that's fine. Um, uh -huh. Whatever you want. The, the special session was supposed to be about, um, about uh, raising more money for schools okay and as we'll get into it in a minute I, I don't think they're actually raising more money for schools or actually giving a, a huge tax break to to the um, to the highest one percent of income earners in Oregon we'll get into that in a minute mm -hmm. but in order to get um, republic apparently to get Republican votes for uh, the package Governor Kitzhaber added to the package what was uh, called numbered SB Senate bill 863 Okay. And um, as this chart indicates, this is, this is the effective language of the bill. It says a local government may not enact or enforce a local law or measure, including but not limited to an ordinance, regulation, control area, or quarantine, to inhibit or prevent the production or use of agricultural seed, flower seed, nursery seed, or vegetable seed, or products of those kinds of seed. Products of? Products of seed. And it is included, it includes... Any local laws or measures for regulating the display, distribution, growing, harvesting, labeling, marketing, mixing, notification of use, planting, possession, processing, registration, storage, transportation, or use of agricultural seed, flower seed, nursery seed, or vegetable seed, or products of those types of seed. Now, if you look up the definitions in Oregon uh, law, existing law, by the way, the, the, the new bill doesn't define um, these terms. If you look at under, under Oregon existing law, you can see that agricultural seed, flower seed, nursery seed, and vegetable seed basically covers all kinds of seed except for weeds. Okay. Weeds are a separate <laughs> thing. <laughs> anything, any seed that produces anything of value is, is covered within these categories. For example, nursery seed includes trees. Now, the the crucial term in this law, which passed as part of the as part of the, the special session pa package, is products of seed. That's not defined anywhere. You know, it, there's no specific definition of it in Oregon law. What is a product of of seed? Anything that results of the seed. Uh... It includes everything except something that's made in the laboratory, huh? You would think that a plant is a product of seed. Yes. And um, there was, um, in mm. as part of this process, legislative council issued an opinion in which indicated that plants were, the belief that they thought that plants were, were products of seed. So what this bill does is that it prevents local government uh, from in any, any way controlling um, seeds or products of seeds. So what can that, what are some of, what would be some of the effects of that? Now, you might have noticed in the press that this, this bill was characterized as um, eliminating local restrictions on, gen, on GMO, genetically modified organisms. Is this because, because, is this because of labeling? No, the, it's because... I mean the bill. It was the, the bill came along because Jackson County Benton County and some other counties were in the, the folks there were in the process of putting measures on the ballot to forbid in those counties the planting of genetically modified seeds. Uh -huh. um, labeling is a separate is a separate matter. Okay. And you may recall that um, that um, 
recently some genetically modified wheat was found growing in Oregon yeah. on a plot of land where genetically modified wheat had never been planted. And so the question was, where did that come from? It was nearby a Monsanto experiment in genetically modified wheat. And uh, that resulted in the cancellation of hundreds of millions of dollars worth of orders from Japan, from abroad, mm -hmm. because they forbid the importation uh, of genetically modified um, food. So um, uh, it, it's a very big economic issue. Uh, on the state level, the government has done nothing to prevent the spread of genetically modified in organisms and doesn't have any regulation of it. So that's why the folks on the local level were putting these were putting measures on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Um, they have some sort of control. Right. So this, what this bill is, was portrayed yeah. as, as removing any local control of, for, you know, restricting the planting of, of genetically modified seeds. Um, it does have an exception, by the way, for Jackson County only. The Jackson, it allows the Jackson County, that's Medford in that area, uh, in southern Oregon, it allows that county's ballot measure to go ahead in in the, in the May ballot. Uh, they have a measure on the ballot uh, next May of 2014 to forbid the, basically the planting of and growing of genetically modified uh, plants. But if you look at the bill itself, Senate Bill 863, the words genetically modified an organism don't even exist in the bill. Hmm. It doesn't say anything about genetically modified seeds or plants. It, it replies to all of these kinds of seeds and plants, basically everything mm -hmm. except weeds. So what, what effect would this have? The next uh, chart indicates that yeah. it could nullify local laws on smoking in public places or against teenagers buying tobacco because that would inhibit the use of a product of seed. Tobacco, tobacco is a product, tobacco of, is seed. A product of seed. Mm -hmm. And the local government cannot in any way inhibit the use of a product of seed. That would also eliminate programs to discourage youth smoking. It would eliminate time and place restrictions on public drinking of alcohol. Would eliminate uh, zoning regulations to protect residential areas from agricultural pesticides, and it would res it would eliminate local laws restricting the cutting of old trees. So, it's um, it is um, way overkill, shall we say? What's the real reason for this uh, this uh, bill? The real reason for the bill is because Monsanto and other um, agribusiness corporations. Um, make large campaign contributions in Oregon, and that's what. And they want no regulation, no control on what they're about and where they can do their thing mm -hmm. and sell their products and have their influence. Mm -hmm. So, if Monsanto and corporations like that have their way, uh, farmers throughout the country and the world will have to buy the seeds they use to grow their product from Monsanto because everything will be genetically modified. Or they will find their own crops, even if they don't want to be to have genetically modified crops. They will find their crops contaminated, contaminated. with genetically modified um, <clears throat> pollen. So, sort of like uh, the attempt to control drinking water supplies globally. If you can control the food supplies globally, then you have the, the damnedest kind of a global dictatorship that's unbelievable uh, owned in well it's and it's it's kind of like the the federal you know the federal alleged crisis you know oh we're holding we are the republicans are holding the government hostage uh, in order to defund obamacare for example well here the oregon legislature and governor are holding uh, oregon's food supply hostage uh, they're saying in order to uh, in order to change the tax system to provide more funds for schools, we'll only do that if we can, if we can um, uh, prevent any local regulation of the food supply. You know, totally unrelated thing, right? Why is that less ho hostage taking than um, than attempting to to defund Obamacare? Why do we have this kind of legislation, legislating going on? Is it because the people who actually do it are beholden to? The corporations of Monsanto and the people who own the legislators. Absolutely, yes, because it now costs, um, in a contested House or Senate race in Oregon, half a million dollars to a million dollars to win, and that money comes um, 
Um, almost none of it comes in small contributions from individuals. Um, the vast majority of it comes in large contributions from corporations and corporate executives, and um, a a lesser amount, but but still large quantities from labor unions. Whatever happened to government of the people by the people? I don't even go any further than that. Is this government by the people? The, the it's by some of the people. For example, the, the next chart shows that it's by the top one percent of the people. This is in this is a, a a chart from the Oregon Center for Public Policy, which is a, a very um, useful think tank mm -hmm. um, in Silverton, Oregon. Puts out lots of useful information that is uh, that is really not available elsewhere. Is it left or right, or, or centrist, or apolitical? I'd say it is, it is slightly um, slightly liberal, slightly mm -hmm. left, mm -hmm. but it depends on your perspective. Of course. From my perspective, it's, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> we know that, Dan. <laughs> and correct. But um, this, um, the, um, the tax bill that passed, bills, several of them that passed in the, in the special session, were pro portrayed as a, as a tax increase. But it's actually a very large tax decrease for the top 1% of, of income earners in Oregon. And this chart, uh, this chart illustrates um, what, would ha what happens under the bills that were, that were passed by the legislature. That is, folks who are in particularly the middle 20% of income levels um, uh, and um, are going to pay more in tax Oregon taxes every year, 152 more, 328 more, 357 more, and the, the, the top income level is going to pay something like, each individual, something like $9,000 less in taxes. And the, main, and the reason for that is because um, what is, is the change in how um, corporations are taxed, and that is um, what the bill did is that um, currently, let's say that you are, um, you have a small, you have a, uh, a corporation and um, the corporation uh, pays, you, pays you a salary. Um, you pay Oregon's regular income tax rates on that salary. It's up to 9% income tax rate. What this bill does is says, well, the money that the corporation pays you is to be taxed in your hands at the corporate tax rate and not at the individual tax rate. And that's only about six and a half percent. So it basically um, reduces the tax rates on, on folks who control their own corporations. Uh, and it's mainly professionals. It's mainly you know, lawyers, doctors, and accountants who, who will be obtaining the lion's share um, of this, of this um, additional tax break. So that was another price to pay in order to get more funding for schools. We had to remove all local control of seeds and plants, and we had to dramatically reduce um, income taxes on the wealthiest 1% of Oregonians. In order to get to avoid uh, taking monies from social needs, so um, again, you know, um, hostage taking, I guess, is in the hands of the is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, but I think if um, I would just like to uh, indicate why this is probably going to be getting worse in the near future rather than better, mm -hmm. and that is the new U.S. Supreme Court case um, called uh, McCutcheon. Um, oh yeah, I want to hear about your views on that one. In the McCutcheon case, um, the there is a, a there's been a federal law for many years that um, imposes, of course, restrictions on uh, political campaign contributions to federal in federal candidate races, and that means president and and folks running for Congress. For example, as this table indicates, right now, an individual can contribute, um, and this is per election, meaning once in the primary and again in the general election. An individual can contribute twenty-two thousand six hundred dollars to any federal candidate. This is a, 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 a McCain Feingold. This is the uh, this is the result. McCain Feingold was the latest sort of amendment to this system. Okay. Yes, 
um, but the system of limits has been in place uh, since the since um, the Federal Campaign Finance Reform Act of 1974. 74. Um, so an individual can give $2,600 to a candidate, yeah. the candidate's committee, and give $5,000, this is all in the left-hand column, $5,000 to a national party committee. It can, an individual can give $5,000 to a state, district, or local party committee, $5,000 to a PAC, various sorts. Um, and so those are, those are the limits. And of course, there are lots of different candidates running. There's going to be you know, hundreds of candidates running for Congress. And so if you gave 2600 to all of the candidates you like, um, plus you could give 2600 to all of the candidates who in the primary election are running against the candidate you don't like, um, pretty soon that adds up to real money. It could add up to, to an, that an individual could um, contribute millions of dollars to campaigns, um, even involving a single congressional race. Um, because you could, um, well, not involving a single congressional race, you could contribute millions of dollars involving several congressional races. So federal law contains an, an aggregate biennial limit on what any individual can contribute in doing political contributions. And that's currently $48,600 to all candidates. It's in the, sort of in the top right uh, of the chart. And $74,600 to all political committees and parties. So you add it up all, up all together and it's $123,200. So what McCutcheon is about is it's someone who, who wants to not be limited to $123,000 uh, in, in campaign contributions to candidates and committees in any particular two-year election cycle. We want to remove the aggregate limit. And that effectively would mean no limits mm -hmm. because um, the the individual limits including, include that an individual can give $5,000 to any, num any political action committee, basically. And there's no limit on the number of political action this committees. This is like Citizens United on steroids or upgrade or what? Well, they, they're not satisfied with what they get with Citizens, Citizens United. Right. Now, in, um, but basically, if you eliminate the aggregate limit, then you've eliminated all limits because the number of political committees can proliferate. Mm -hmm. And if you can give five thousand dollars to if an individual can give five thousand dollars to every political committee, and every political committee can give five thousand dollars to every candidate, um, you can see that there's effectively no limit because the number of political committees will simply increase. Well, then why can't the, tra the uh, trade unions uh, spend money like that? Oh, they can. They'll. They will definitely do that. They'll definitely create political committees. Well, does not it kind of equal the, the playing field, level the playing field? Uh, if you can, everybody can contribute all the money they want. Oh no! Why because not? because union members um, don't have millions of dollars individually to contribute. This eliminating the in, the limit on individual contributions has nothing to do with the ban. Federal law has banned corporate. Treasury contributions to candidates and, commi and committees since about 1907, and has banned union contributions to to federal candidates or committees since 1946. So the bottom line uh, reason for this McCutcheon's uh, that the Supreme Court is considering now mm -hmm. is to have uh, the corporations or the super rich uh, even have more money to spend to own the uh, legislators and own the entire system. Right. Now, as this chart indicates, that when, before Citizens United was decided in January of 2010, that this independent spending, that is folks who just, uh, and entities that go out and spend on their own advertisements without making contributions to candidates or committees, was actually liberal candidates were receiving the benefit of that um, more than others. Then the Citizens United decision came along in January 2010, and of course, once the limits were eliminated, then the, the wealthy and the super wealthy uh, and corporations were able to spend money promoting the candidates that they really like, who are the Republicans, and that's why the red line, the conservative line, went way up. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing is illustrated in this chart, showing that the little blue chunks were the amount of independent expenditures on, on liberal candidates. The red chunk is the 
independent expenditures on conservative candidates. And you can see that the conservative number went way up after Citizens United. Those, that's the 2010 number and the 2012 number. You've got about three or four more minutes before we're going to okay. have to start, start winding down. Right. Um, in the Citizens United case, that's where the Supreme Court said, well, you know, we're going to eliminate and remove all the restrictions on independent expenditures because it's not like you can corrupt a candidate by making an independent expenditure for an ad to promote that candidate. Justice Kennedy said in Citizens United, as this chart indicates, the absence of prearrangement and coordination undermines the value of the expenditure to the candidate and alleviates the danger that expenditures will be given as a quid pro quo for improper commitments. So that's why, that's the rationale Kennedy used in Citizens United. But in oral argument in McCutcheon a couple of days ago, Kennedy said this, you have two, two persons. One person gives an amount to a candidate that's limited. The other takes out ads, uncoordinated, just all on his own, costing 500000 Don't you think that the second person has more access to the candidate when the candidate is successful than the first? So 100% reversal. In Citizens United in 2010, he said, oh, independent expenditures for ads, for political ads, don't corrupt the candidate, can't possibly influence the candidate. And now he's saying, oh, yes, it does. And you know, these you know, large independent expenditures do influence the candidate. And now he's using that as a rationale to strike down the limits on contributions to candidates. Why do you think he did that? <laughs> um, some folks believe that, um, I guess, government is best, that is, that is um, dependent upon um, unlimited contributions from, from corporations and the wealthy. And I guess he believes that. Some folks, who are those some folks? Any idea who they are? Sure, the five justices on the Supreme Court who ruled in, in Citizens United and probably the same five justices who are going to rule in the McCutcheon case. So you think it's going to go that way? Yeah, absolutely. What are we going to do with the ordinary citizenry? Um, that's a good question. There are, certain, there are certain turning points, I think, in history. And Citizens United was a turning point in history. You betcha. Um, what it did is that it, um, as those earlier charts indicated, it put a huge amount of money into the Republican congressional races in 2010. And basically, gerrymandering. Well, even without gerrymandering, it moved the House of Representatives from, the, from having a, about a 60 percent Democratic majority into having a Republican majority. And the really the crucial part of it is, is that after Citizens United was decided in January 2010, at a time when the when for a full year the the Democrats had large majorities in both the House and the Senate and the presidency, they didn't do anything to counter it. They could have removed the Supreme Court's jurisdiction from uh, reviewing the constitutionality of campaign finance reform cases, but they didn't do it because I think um, they saw that in the past they had been the main beneficiaries mm -hmm. of large independent expenditures. And so they figured, eh, what do we care if the independent expenditures by corporations are unlimited? The corporations are our friends. But once the corporations were totally unleashed, they spent the money on their real friends. <laughs> They're going to yell at me in a minute to shut things down. So, with all we've talked about this evening, do you have any summary comments uh, for the viewers about uh, what we've talked about? Anything else as a closing thought in about uh, 45 seconds or so? Well, I would just urge folks to get involved in the, in the Progressive Party of Oregon. Here's our here's the website, phone number, email, and... Um, all we can do is, is, um, is fight against these uh, constant attacks on democracy, and that's, what, that's really what it is. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dan, for coming aboard. All right. Yeah. So we should start winding down now. Shall we have some public service announcements, Mr. E, or is it too early yet? To watch my shows on the web, Google Don Baham YouTube. There's hundreds of shows there. You can see my interviews with other guests. Uh, people like Dan and all sorts of other citizens out there who are curious about where our democracy is heading and what's going on. And the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, I've been a member of that organization for some 40 years or so. Without the ACLU, our civil liberties would be further down the tube than they are. So join the ACLU. My next PSA is about 
corporate personhood, and you know how I feel about corporate personhood. To end corporate personhood, go to movetoamend.org. Amending corporate personhood would say that uh, corporations are not persons, and money is not speech. We've got to take our country back and stop, stop the direction that's heading in, even under Obama. And to learn more about humanists and humanism, go to the American Humanist org site and learn more about humanists and humanism because I'm a humanist as you know. So the Alliance for Democracy, it's a wonderful organization I belong to. And the national website, the Alliance for Democracy.org, and the Portland website at AFD pdx.org. It's a national organization and the Portland chapter works very hard uh, with people like Dan Meek about what's going on in Oregon to be sure that justice is done and our voices are being heard. Yeah, the Populist Dialogues. That's a wonderful uh, program that's uh, done by my friend David Delk. And he uh, has half our shows. And you can go to that website and see his shows. And remember, oh, KFC, I got to tell you about KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind. Be friendly and be charitable to you, too. And you, and you, and you especially, and you too. Thanks again for watching. Good night. <laughs>